critical for the survival of brook trout. Uh, their optimum range is in the 50s, between 51 and 59. That's when they grow the best. Uh, they have the best energy requirements, that sort of thing. As the temperatures start going, they start to get stressed. At about 67 degrees, they stop growing altogether. They're spending all their energy just breathing and sustaining. And it's about 70 degrees is kind of the cutoff uh, for having a sustained population of brook trout. A lot of people, it's actually might be a few degrees less. I mean, this is from the literature. One thing people have to keep in mind with all of these fish is like people don't know everything about it. We're constantly learning something new about brook trout and other species. So these are just some general guidelines. At about 86 degrees, they die instantly. Um, if you put them in water that's about 78 degrees for any length of time, they'll die. And so what does a brook trout eat in these streams? They feed a lot of times on invertebrates, like this caddis fly, uh, but they'll feed on just about anything they can get their mouth on. This is a little brook trout. It's only about this long, and it was feeding on uh, a little mummy child in the child's river. So they'll feed on just about anything they can get their mouths on. Like most animals, they're opportunists. One thing that they do require is um, cover. Uh, they're very susceptible, like they feed on the insects and the little fish, things like they feed on the brook trout. So it's very important to have some sort of cover to protect these fish throughout their lifespan. <clears throat> the average growth rate here in Massachusetts, um, at the end of their first year, they were about four inches long, six inches at age two, and about nine inches at age three. That's a typical growth rate for a Massachusetts brook trout. In the Berkshires, the brook trout are a dime a dozen. Just about any small stream in the Berkshires contains brook trout. Here in Eastern Mass, it's a different story. Uh, but that just gives you some idea of uh, the growth rates of the trout. And you see, I only go up to about age three. Uh, usually, brook trout in this area don't live to be more than three or four years old. Most of the time, you can't tell the sex of a brook trout except in the spawning season. Uh, during the breeding colors, the males get this hooked jaw. They get a nice color on their belly, they get a deeper body, whereas the female is more streamlined. Sometimes you can actually see a rounded belly that indicates she's full of eggs. But it's only during the breeding season they can really tell them apart. And as I mentioned before, the lifespan in this area is about four years. So we're a very short-lived species. In this area, they typically spawn in late October, early November. Typically, it's usually more around Veterans Day in this area. From Halloween to Veterans Day is kind of like peak spawning in this area. The female builds are red, uh, and the eggs incubate in the gravel throughout the winter. They usually hatch out in late January or February in this area. The areas they select for these spawnings are very uh, specific. They typically look for upwelling areas of springs, especially where the edge of the bank meets the river. So there's very specific areas that these brook trout seek out to spawn. It has to have upwelling spring water, and it has to have a substrate of sand or coarse gravels. But it's very specific areas in the stream that they choose to spawn. After they hatch out of the, the reds, they basically seek these little margin areas. Uh, and you can actually see these young of year brook trout along the margins right now. And Red Brook, which is right down from the office I spend a lot of time at, uh, it's been a great year for the hatch. I've been seeing a lot of young of year brook trout, which is good, because the, the young of year brook trout are the future of any population. But the thing we're talking about today is the sea run brook trout, which is the anatomous form of the brook trout. They're called salters here on Cape Cod. Some other names are called sea run brook trout. The Canadians actually have it right. They call them sea run brook char, since they're not actually a trout. Some of the old literature talks about a sea trout. Um, if you're from Europe, a sea trout is actually a brown trout. But here we call them salters. And this is a picture of one uh, that's basically in April. And it's got that silvery sheen indicating that it spent some time in the marine environment. They typically lose this color within a couple of weeks of being in the fresh water. So it's, I've only seen a few fish myself that have that bright silver coloration. But one thing that enables them, when they go down into the salt water, they can take advantage of the much richer food resources in the stream. So they can grow to a much larger size. 
I mentioned that the silver sheen when they first come back out of the water, with this large size, people used to think that anything over 12 inches long in one of these streams was a salt or brook trout. Since our tagging studies, we found that's not necessarily true. But one thing that you, I want to point out on this uh, fish too, if you look right here, there's a little mark in there. That was a bird talon that went in there. And this was one of the largest uh, fish that I've seen from Red Brook. I think John Kokoska from Trout Limited was there that day when we uh, found these fish. So the birds that can be a major source of mortality for these coastal brook trout populations. We routinely find that the bigger fish have some sort of bird scar on it. You can see some of the, the wounds here, uh, generally from ospreys or from a, a great blue herring where they actually dart down and get the fish. Uh, some fish, I mean that fish, the intestines were exposed. That fish actually survived for a couple months with that type of wound. Uh, but not all of them survived. I mean, I've had reports of people seeing brook trout go off in the talons of osprey at Red Brook and other streams. So, Birds can be a major problem uh, for these fish. Another problem that we've been seeing a lot lately is the otters. Uh, the river otter population on Cape Cod is really starting to come back. Um, they're found in just about any of the rivers now. I routinely see these otter stat, which is this grayish things with fish scales and various fish bones along these rivers. And, uh, last year I actually saw some glimpses of these large dark animals that darted into the water. But they're very secretive. If you do see an otter, you're kind of lucky because they're a very secretive animal. But they are fairly common now on the streams of Cape Cod. So what do we know about the history of sea run brook trout on Cape Cod? Well, some of the earliest records that we have was actually some oral legends of the Wampanoag tribe here on Cape Cod. They talked about the formation of the San Truitt River, here it was called the Catruitt River on this old map, as being formed by a great trout that forced its way up to the ocean to hear a Native American a woman singing a song up near San Truitt Pond. Uh, and the, the way the story goes, it's like he was a fish and she was a, a human and it didn't work out and so they both died of a broken heart and they buried up in the trout pond here in San Truitt Pond. This story you can see in some of the literature written by the Wampanoags. It was actually also in uh, the, the book Massachusetts by the WPA project during the, the Great Depression. They wrote a history of each state, and that little uh, legend is actually in that book. So it dates back quite far. Some of the older records that we have of the Seaman Brook Trout actually date back to the 1700s when sport fishing was just starting to develop here in Massachusetts. A guy named John Rowe who actually had a lot of money so he could afford to go fishing. Uh, since he was a merchant, he was actually one of the owners of the Boston Tea Party ships. Rose Wharf is named after him. So he was a pretty well-to-do merchant, so he had time to invest in the best fishing tackle from Britain and go off down and journey to Cape Cod by stagecoach, might have taken him a day or so. And he reported in May catching 10 trout up to 18 inches, which I, is huge. I have yet to see a salter brook trout that's 18 inches. I've seen about 14, 15, possibly a 17 inches. But he, he caught 10 trout then, which was a pretty good catch in those days. But unfortunately, that was one of our uh, early streams to be lost here on Cape Cod. Uh, the Winding River actually flowed out of Herring Pond uh, down into Buzzards Bay. That stream was lost entirely back around 1914 or so when they started building the Cape Cod Canal. So there's actually two salter streams, the Scusset River and the Monument River, that both contained brook trout at one point of time. So those are gone now. Now we have the distinctive Cape Cod Canal, which marks the entryway to Cape Cod and also basically makes it an island. Uh, but when you cross over the Cape Cod Canal, remember that that used to be once a cold water stream back in the day. Some other early records we have of the, the Sea Run Brook Trout Fishery here on Cape Cod was uh, a book written by Jerome Smith, A Natural History of the Fishes of Massachusetts. He was actually a doctor out on Rainsford Island, which was a quarantine island for the Port of Boston. Uh, this was actually carved by him in 1826. And so he developed an interest in fish and fisheries while he was out on that island. Uh, he ended up writing a book, A Natural History of the Fishes of Massachusetts. If you're an ichthyologist, he got it all wrong. He basically took a lot of the species from Europe and tried to say they were the same species here in Massachusetts. 
But one of the most important things about that book is the last chapter is talking about Cape Cod trout fishing. And it's a story of what he found fishing on Cape Cod back in, in the 1820s and 1830s. In the Child's River, he caught 70 trout in one day out of the Child's River. And he talked about another stream called the Quashnet, where the sea trout were sometimes taken. Uh, but even at that time, there was a mill. And he didn't think it would be much after the, the mill got through with the stream. But this is an indication of what the resource was actually like back in those early days. <coughs> Another famous person used to come down here to Cape Cod to fish for trout was Daniel Webster. He was one of the famous American statesmen and orator. Uh, and the story goes in his memoirs that one of his most important speeches was at the Bunker Hill Monument in 1825, 50 years after the uh, start of the Revolutionary War. And while he was down there fishing in the Mashpee River for trout, he came upon uh, this thing, oh, venerable men, is how we started the speech. And supposedly the first living organism to hear that was the trout of the Mashpee River. And that's what Daniel Webster uh, put in his memoirs. This is an old curry and knives, uh, knives trout that supposedly shows him catching a 14-pound brook trout down in one of the streams on Long Island. Whether that's true or not is up for discussion, but uh, that's the story. Some other early records that we have about these sea run trout abundance was a letter back in 1838 talking about the salmon trout, which is another name for the sea run brook trout. And they talked about taking over a thousand pounds a year out of these sandwich waters, and basically they would ship them up to the Boston market, and they would basically get twice as much money for them as they would for brook trout from the, the other streams, because they were the sea run trout with the nice orange flesh, and so they were highly valued by people as a food resource. Uh, these days, I don't think there's much left of any brook trout in the Scorton Creek. I had one report of a brook trout taken in a minnow trap a few years ago, but I had yet to find any wild trout in this system. This area right here with the grist mill, uh, that was our old East Sandwich fish hatchery that was established around 1912. Uh, but right now, I don't think there's much of anything for a resource. I've been poking around in there, and hopefully one day I'll find a remnant brook trout in there. But all this fishing, that 70 trout that they reported catching, they didn't practice catch and release. Those are 70 trout that they uh, boxed up, took home, and ate. Uh, so the over-harvest of these streams by both recreational fishermen and commercial fishermen led to their one of the main reasons that was led to their decline. But there's other factors that led to their decline as well. Probably the biggest one was dams. Here in uh, eastern Massachusetts, water was the source of power. Almost every little river was dammed up at one point in time. And these dams can have major impacts on the ecology of a river. They trap sediment, they block fish passage, they warm the water. These days there's actually safety issues with their dams. Uh, this is actually a picture of Foundry Pond Dam in Westport. Before this dam was here, there was probably Sea Run Brook Trout running up here. This is the east branch of the Westport River. So all that decline in fisheries from the overfishing in the dams basically led to um, people taking uh, information from France where they were able to actually culture the trout. There was the brown trout, and they decided to uh, try to artificially propagate fish. One of the first places in uh, the United States where it was tried was right here in Sandwich, right below one of the Sean Ponds. A guy from, he was a commercial fisherman from Provincetown, came down here and did some of the first experiments. This was in 1856 uh, where he took that. He was able to successfully uh, fertilize the eggs, but they ended up dying of fungus, so he didn't actually hatch them out into fingerlings or adult trout. But it was one of the earliest records we have of artificial propagation of trout. Unfortunately, where he got those fish from, there's no longer trout. Um, Smith talked about this distinctive red-spotted trout that were in these Sean ponds back in the 1830s. They were probably here in 1856. Now they're entirely gone. It's a largemouth bass pond for the most part. So all this decline in the fisheries led to the formation of our agency back in 1866. It was actually 1865. They did a little work before, but we considered the start of our agency uh, in 1866 with a man named Theodore Lyman, who became our first commissioner of fisheries. Theodore Lyman came down 
uh, to Buzzards Bay looking at the decline of the herring and the trout fisheries. He was introduced to a man named Samuel Tisdale, who was the person who actually brought largemouth bass to Massachusetts. That's probably one of our principal game fish right now, is the largemouth bass. Uh, he actually brought smallmouth bass from Saratoga Lakes. He was a, a noted fisheries person. He was also an industrialist. Theodore Lyman came down here, met Samuel Tisdale, set up a, uh, one of the first state trout hatcheries on land owned by Samuel Tisdale in Wareham. And while he was down there, he discovered a little brook called Red Brook. And this is actually from his writings, the Red Brook Journal. He started it as a, a journal of the hatching house in Maple Springs, and he continued it as a journal of Red Brook. He started buying the property at Red Brook back in 1870, and his family protected it for many years. And you're going to hear a lot about Red Brook, uh, and we can thank it that for Theodore Lyman for actually buying the property back in the 1870s. So this crow tagging and transplantation I'm going to be talking about, it's been going on for a long time. Uh, here's from the Commissioner of Fisheries Report 1869. It was probably written by Theodore Lyman. He talked about fish from the Quashtek Brook being put into the Mashpee River and growing almost a pound over a couple of years. And you'll also notice there's a lot of familiar names that will keep on coming up. Uh, Mr. G.L. Fessenden. Well, that was Fessenden's Tavern that Daniel Webster used to come down and stay at while he was fishing on Cape Cod. But by the 1950s, um, the sea run brook trout were almost uh, a memory. People really didn't find much of them. They weren't abundant at all. Uh, so a noted scientist, some of you may actually have known him, John Reither, uh, he came down here as a young person and he started looking at these streams. And his idea was to overstock them with hatchery fish to enable, to basically force the fish out into the sea to find food. And so he was hoping that that would improve the salter trout population by basically overstocking it uh, with that. And they basically took fish from the sandwich hatchery and heavily stocked all these coastal rivers. The Childs, the Quashtan, Nashville, Quaker Run, St. Truett, and Marston. They were all stocked heavily with uh, hatchery brook trout from the sandwich hatchery. He did find some movement between the rivers, but uh, there was no great abundance of sea run brook trout. But one of the things that came out of that was the, one of the first purchases by our division to protect uh, sea run brook trout. And that was along the Quashtan River. There was some bogs that were abandoned after some of the big hurricanes in the early 50s. And we purchased the Quashtan River back in 1956. And this shows somebody fishing right after it was purchased by the division. And at that time, it still had some brookies in there. But like I say, people had given up on the brook trout. Uh, in the 1960s, they started stocking these streams with brown trout. In the 1970s and 1980s, these streams that once supported sea run brook trout were very heavily stocked with brown trout. And if you're a fisherman, I mean, these are much larger size. Some of them got up to about nine pounds. And when we first started electric fishing on the Quashnet with Fran and others, uh, I'd have some of the fishermen, oh, back in the day, we used to catch the big brown trout in here. Well, the brown trout, you have to remember, they're from Europe. They're not that native species. And so when I came out here, I discovered there was still sea run brook trout. And I know Fran all along was hoping to reestablish the, the sea run brook trout in the Quashnet. So Fran had been working on this since 1975. I started in 1990. I'm fairly a newcomer compared to Fran, who's been working on this river since 1975. Fran and others have put in tens of thousands of hours trying to restore the habitat. And at first, it was focused in on the brown trout. Uh, they put in a lot of overhead covers and deflectors. And now Fran's planting a lot of trees, which is good, because that's the future uh, that's going to grow up and protect this river. But as many, many thousands of hours have gone into improving this river. We came out, I came out here in 1990. I had discussions with Fran, with Ken Simmons and other people. Uh, and we decided that there was still wild brook trout in these streams. And maybe we should stop the stocking of brown trout. So we stopped the stocking of brown trout in the St. River River first. Uh, then I believe it was the Mashpee, then the Quashnick. And uh, you can see, basically, it was right around this period of time that we stopped the stocking. Back when they were heavily stocking, most of the fish that were caught in the river were brown trout. We stopped the stocking around 93. And since that time, the brook trout population has increased. The brown trout died off. Uh, they we used to have a little bit of reproduction by the brown trout when they were stocked. But after we stopped stocking, they disappeared. 
And this gives an indication of how much the population has grown over time. Uh, back in the 80s, it started as actually they were collecting these brown trout to create a unique strain of uh, broodstock at the sandwich hatchery. Since that time, we've continued it almost every year with a few interruptions uh, as basically an inventory of what the trout population is doing. And this sections one through four is below what's called the fish ladder. It's the upper reaches of the lower part of the washroom. And here in 2013, you can see some of these fish are really uh, nice right now. This is a wild brook trout from the Quashnick River, probably a male of spawning coloration. So we seem to be getting some fairly sizable uh, trout now in the Quashnick River. And I think the combination of the habitat improvement, the stopping of the brown trout, uh, changes in the regulations have all helped the brook, brook trout population to increase in this river. <coughs> So one of the questions was, is like, are these fish really like just uh, fish from the hatchery that just happen to reproduce, or are they actually some sort of unique genetic strain? Brendan and Ed came out here uh, in the uh, eight, late 80s, or early 80s, and he did, developed a master's thesis project in looking at the genetics of some of these remnant strains of brook trout. He sampled fish from the San Chuit River, the Mashpee, the Quashnet, Red Brook, and also a stream on Long Island that still had some wild brook trout. And one of the things that he found was they were distinctly different from the hatchery strain of fish. And the other thing that was interesting, they were actually different from each other. So this gave us hope that these might actually be some of the remnant brook trout strains that existed in these rivers. If you look at the time, this, a lot of this was done around 2003 and finally got published in uh, 2010, I guess it was, or 2012. So it takes a long time sometimes to publish your results. But one of the things Brendan's interest in this led to the development of our project uh, using pig tags with the help of the Conti Anatomist Fish Lab, uh, an intern that Brendan had hired called Andrew Tweel. They set up a project with help from Fran Smith and myself looking at pig tagging. And so we tagged these fish, we set up the antennas first underneath the uh, Route 28 bridge, and we decided to find the movements of these fish. So this is how it started back in 2007. Now we have a total of seven antennas going on three rivers. I, I don't have to do the weekly battery changes anymore, which is great since I took over the project after about six months. And it used to be very tiring carrying two 55-pound batteries down these narrow paths to replenish the batteries on these antennas. Now I have solar panels. And with the increase in sun right now, they're working very well. And so to give you some idea of how it functions, there's a wire inside these PVC tubes. And the fish with the tag swims through it. Uh, it beeps off a little signal. It's picked up by this uh, receiver here, very similar to what's going on with the herring right now in the Kunamesa River. It gives me the, the number, which allows me to identify the fish individually and the date and time it went through. So right now I have tens of thousands of data records from uh, three different rivers. And some of the things they're giving, besides this movement data, it's giving us information on growth rates. This was one of the largest fish that we got in the Quashnet River. Uh, it was tagged as about a year and a half old in 2007, and it was alive at least two years after that, so it was at least a three and a half year old fish, almost four years old. So this was a 14 inch fish. It only went down to the tide water once, and that was in the middle of summer. It was supposed to have gone down in the winter. This one went down once to the area of 28 and it was still able to grow 14 inches. And that's because of the herring and all the other fish that are coming down the river after they spawn up in John's Pond. But we're learning a lot of different things about uh, these trout from the tagging. This tagging also gave us some uh, ideas and incentive to try to do some management using the pit tagging technology. And one of the things that we looked at was the Child River. I mentioned it used to have 70 trout. They caught in the 1830s there. Uh, well, we sampled the river in 2006. I think we found one adult trout, no reproduction, and we'd been in there many years before and hadn't found wild brook trout reproduction in there at all. And so we decided to take uh, this pit tagging technology and transplant the fish from the Quashnet River. The population had recovered up enough in the Quashnet that we felt comfortable we could take some fish from the Quashnet put them in the childs. We did that for three years, 2008, 2009, 2010. And we've had a successful year class every year since 2009. And so they're basically on their own right now, 
reproducing in the river. And so this technology, the improvement in the Quashtet River, the technology allowed us to do this experiment of transplanting the fish. And you have to remember, these fish were heavily stocked with hatchery fish, but they didn't survive. But these wild fish that we moved in did reproduce. To give you an idea of um, you know, some of the data that we collect, we look at length frequency distributions, um, and that's how we can tell the age of a fish. So in 2008, these were the fish that we moved in from the Quashtet. We moved in adults so that they would be ready to spawn in the fall. We moved them in the spring, and they spawned in the fall. The following year, a big year class was produced, and these were actually fish we had moved in the following year. In 2010, some of those fish that were the younger year started growing up into adulthood. Uh, and by 2011, you can have a, a, a pretty good distribution of year classes in there. And some of the fish that are produced in the Childs River now are very chunky. Uh, they found some excellent growth rates in the Childs River. It was almost virgin territory going in there. And so these fish grew very rapidly that were in the Childs the first year. And this is an indication of the fish that we put in. Uh, you can see some growth rates with the days at large from the Quashnan and Green and Red Brook in red. Those fish that we put in the Childs River the first year, they just grew phenomenally. Those were the adults that were moved in from the Quashnan. So we decided to try that in the Kunamesic River as well. Uh, when I start, first started working on the Kunamesic River, there was really no records that I knew of that the Kunamesic once supported brook trout. Bob Golder found an old record that indicated there were salted brook trout in the Kunamesic River in the late 1800s. Uh, but by the 1940s, in all the records, basically in the um, 60s, 70s, and 80s, we didn't find any reproducing brook trout in the Kunamesic. So we decided to move some in from the Mashpee River. Uh, we basically sampled the Mashpee River. We selected the larger fish, the adults. You see this is the young here fish here. And we moved them into the Kunabeset. We took 20 adults. We put them in the Kunabeset River above Sandwich Road, where we had previously identified cold water habitat. And this gives you an indication. So once again, we took them. We picked tagged them so we could follow them and we released them into the, the upper Kunamesic River above Sandwich Road. And we went in there in September of 2014, and sure enough, uh, we had great success. They put off a pretty good year class just from those 20 fish that were first introduced from the Mashpee River. So that gave us an indication the habitat was suitable and there was a spawning area there that they could take advantage of. And we tagged over 115 with pit tags. <coughs> So this gives you, uh, we first put in there an electric fish, we put them in in 2014, or 2013, in 2014. We sampled in fall of 2014, you can see this was the year class in green that was produced. The adults that we moved in in 2014 from the Ashby River, we actually got some fish that we had moved in 2013, which indicated that they had survived uh, an entire year in the Kunamesic River. So there were multiple year classes in the Kunamesic River in uh, May of 2015, we went in. Uh, you can go in on the water and look this up uh, with the Andy Nebreski of On the Water. He took some great photographs. This is one of the big fish that we put in from the Mashpee River. Uh, it actually survived all that time, basically over the spring and the winter. It survived in the Kunamesic River. And this shows how we actually collect the fish. We basically go down with a backpack electroshocker and sample these fish. And so after three years, you can see this, uh, the year class distribution. We had a little bit less year class produced here in 2015 uh, than we did. That first year was kind of the first year that was a boom year class. So some of these fish have actually moved up. That big blotch you see right here um, has actually moved up. And so they're becoming adult, and hopefully they spawn this past fall in the Kuna Mesa. So I'm very hopeful that the fish got off another spawn in the Kuna Mesa River this past fall and we'll be sampling in May to actually document that. But I want to talk about some of the other restorations. Uh, here at the Kunamesic River, you're talking about a big restoration project on the Cranberry Bogs. And I want to tell you a little bit about some of the other experiences that are out there in terms of Cranberry Bog restoration on some of these wild brook trout streams. One of the first extensive bog restorations was the Eel River in Plymouth. Uh, you might have heard about it. It had wild brook trout in there and also state endangered bridal shiner. Uh, they removed a dam, they did a lot of white cedar plantings, and added a huge amount of woody structure to the stream. 
Uh, but one of the things that happened, uh, we're very concerned about the temperature.